Right. Um, learning from the enemy. I think that Fukuyama had a point, namely that history in the sense of modern history, meaning that the present society had a persistent and serious enemy uh, embodied by the international workers' movement. It's not any longer the case. So that great conflict that people thought was history is indeed quite dead, or at least dormant. And also I think that Ernst Nolte had a point, with most certainly Hitler uh, inaugurated and launched his movement in order to defeat communism. It was a preventive counter-revolution that succeeded most wonderfully. Now, uh, before launching in uh, my son's topic, to put you in the mood, I will read to you two texts that are decisive in uh, the Versailles complex. Uh, one comes directly from Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, and uh, lots of nonsense. And the other is not at all nonsensical, it's a fragment from Ernst Jünger's text, Kampf als innere Erlebnis, in which he formulates the essence of what, in his opinion, has been betrayed in 1918. What I observe how they silently cut lanes through the tangles of barbed wire Dig stepped assault trenches, compare the luminescent watches, and orient themselves towards north by the stars. Then I am overcome with recognition. This is the new man, the storm pioneer, the elite of Central Europe. A whole new race, smart, strong, and filled with will. What reveals itself here as a vision Will tomorrow be the axis around which life revolves still faster and faster? The path will not always, as here, have to be forged through shell craters, fire and steel, but a double quick step with which events are prosecuted here, the tempo accustomed to iron that will remain the same. The glowing twilight of a declining age is at once a dawn in which one arms oneself for new, for harder battles. Far behind the gigantic cities, the hosts of machines, the empires, whose inner bonds have been rent in the storm, await the new men, the cunning, battle-tested men who are ruthless towards themselves and others. This war is not the end but the prelude to violence. It is the forge in which the new world will be hammered into new borders and new communities. New forms want to be filled with blood and power will be wielded with a hard fist. The war is a great school and the new man will bear its stamp. Our stamp. Yes, it is now in its element my old shock troop. The deed, the stroke of the fist, has torn away the fog, etc., etc., etc. Just don't be moved. The festival is about to begin, and we are its princes. So ends Jünger. Great inspiration for the right-wing intelligentsia, then as now, very popular in today's Hungary. Uh, and here is a fragment from Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg's uh, um, confession before a select committee of the Reichstag when he had to uh, explain why the German army was defeated. He says, Chairman, please continue, Field Marshal von Hindenburg. The intentions of the command could no longer be executed. Our repeated proposals for strict discipline and strict legislation were not adopted. Thus did our operations necessarily miscarry. The collapse was inevitable. 
The revolution only provided the keystone. Commotion and shouting, says the protocol. An English general said with justice, the German army was stabbed in the back. No guilt applies to the good corps of the army. Its achievements are just as admirable as those of the officer corps. Where the guilt lies has clearly been demonstrated. That is the general trajectory of the tragic development of the war for Germany after a series of brilliant, unsurpassed successes on many fronts, following an accomplishment by the army and the people for which no praise is high enough. This trajectory had to be established so that the military measures for which we are responsible could be correctly evaluated. In other words, what do Lieutenant Jünger and Field Marshal Hindenburg tell us? That the history is not what has happened. History was something that had a surface, military operations, behind which the subversive activity of the enemies of heroic men did their secret work, and this is the eternal work of enlightenment and revolution, and this is still, with all the changements, all the changes in style, what our adversaries think. And now to Versailles and Trianon. <clears throat> in spite of the fact that the Hungarian-Romanian version of the Versailles complex, that is Trianon, is considerably more alive than the original, Versailles and Saint-Germain, the wounds of pre-World War II Germany and Austria, this is the proper name of the problem. The peace treaties forced upon Central Europe by the victorious allies after both world wars are one of the fundamental causes of the distrust vis-à-vis -vis Western democracy this side of the Rhine. Forgotten are the war aims of the Central Powers and later of the Axis. Forgotten the revolutions of 1917-23. Forgotten the Holocaust and the genocide against Slavs in the East. Forgotten the hopes of 1945. The abstraction of territory and of an historic view of statehood and nationhood inherited by a hegemonic right in Eastern Europe are among the roots for a hatred for the West where this whole problematic is forgotten and where the surfacing misunderstood. Part of the West side complex is also the anti-Russian resentment in Poland Romania, Ukraine, and the Baltic states, partly Finland, the Catholic Orthodox Muslim enmities in the former Yugoslavia, all are fighting the Second World War, unfinished in the political imagination. What is the substance of this complex? There are a number of factors. One, the need of the right in the defeated countries, Germany, Austria, Hungary, especially of the old establishment, to make sense of the military disaster and of the subsequent democratic and socialist revolutions. The need of the same to interpret a profound social change in terms of territory, supremacy, and sovereign power. Third, the need of the old power elites to exculpate themselves for the defeat and to keep on governing. Four, the need to delegitimize the new international order than the emerging democratic and socialist commonwealth, to present the new leaders as the helpers, perhaps the secret agents of the victorious allies and of new Soviet Russia, to equate defeat with treason, Dolchstoss in the Rücken, stabbed in the back by socialists, Jews, internationalists, Freemasons, etc. Fifth, the idea that ethnic Germans and Hungarians in the conquered territories are subjected to the primacy of inferior nations, Slavs and Levantines, thereby a natural hierarchy had been inverted. Six, therefore the revanche, the reversal of the Versailles, Trianon, etc. treaties, the reconquest of lost territories and of the permanent subordination of inferior Eastern peoples would mean the re-establishment of the natural order, also subverted by the democratic West, 
which used the Slavs to tame Germany and her natural allies, the common element between the hostile East and the hostile West being the Jews, either in the liberal or the communist disguise. Uh, the idea that the Soviet Union and the East were used by the hidden powers of Enlightenment and so on to tame a uh, warrior man has resurfaced uh, these days in Hungary where a very nice uh, young Jobbik representative just said that uh, the gypsies are the biological weapons of the Jews. Sorry for the code, but it's literal. Uh, after 1945, both Germany and Austria were forced to abandon territorial demands. Territorial revisionism was a marginal phenomenon at the beginning, and then it has disappeared altogether. But the subterranean nationalism in Hungary and Croatia, where open debate was not allowed and official nationalism, of which there was a lot, was not and could not be revanchist or irredentist, Minority rights were the apparent slogan, accompanied by a creeping historical retrospective identification with the Axis powers, which were the only ones which were able to change for a while the status quo, see the Vienna Treaty in 1940 and the independent Croat puppet state under Ante Pavlic. And old style nationalism, as old style nationalism is quite dead, especially Hungarian national identity is symbolically centered on the lost territories, most particularly on Transylvania. National sentiment is identified on the right almost exclusively with mourning of Trianon. It is not citizenship, it is not statehood, it is not power, it is not success, it is not future, it is not even the glorious past. No, that's nationalism. These powers are not nationalists, they're ethnicists. That's different. In the center, you have the national wounds, the suffering, the loss, the negativity. That's not glorifying past, no. We lost, we lost, we lost, we have been defeated. This is nihilism at its fascist best. So, <clears throat> recently, the blue European flag on the Budapest Parliament building has been replaced by the Fantaisiste secular flag. Seculars are a Hungarian group in northeast Transylvania. And the Hungarian right is holding large symbolic events on Romanian territory every year, where sometimes the whole Hungarian cabinet is present. This is where the present Hungarian prime minister will issue his solemn proclamations and present his liberal views. It's very important that it's taking place not on Hungarian territory. It's in limbo. It's in symbolic past Hungary that we have lost. It's situating himself and themselves on an empty space. Quite something, very postmodern, very with it, very cool. This has the added advantage of being able to side with the losers of the Second World War uh, and identifying the national wound with communism. That is, with any kind of left. The establishment of automatic Hungarian citizenship rights for ethnic Hungarians in the neighboring countries, the successive states, as they're called, called dual citizenship, assumed by circa three quarters of a million people in the region, resisted legally only by Slovakia and the Ukraine, managed to redefine Hungarian citizenship as an ethnic category, rather than uh, something referring to the members of a universal political community on the territory of the Hungarian state. Citizenship has nothing to do with the state, okay? It has to do with ethnicity defined by a loss and by mourning. Um, in the former Yugoslavia, it is mostly denominational differences between the Greek Orthodox Catholics and Muslims that play a similar role of this imaginary reestablishment of civic politics. So our whole history is officially transformed into a series of struggles for ethnic and territorial supremacy whence all memories of, oppression, of the oppression of non-German and non-Hungarian minorities under the Habsburg Empire have been thoroughly extirpated 
not to speak of social and economic conflicts and of any political differences, but the ethnic ones. This serves to the establishment of a conservative culture wherein any lack of reverence for the ethnic tragedy and for its chauvinist idols are tantamount to treason. Depth equals an uncritical understanding of our wounds. In the words of the national poet of the Kadar era, leading literature already from the late 1930s, official bard then as now, Hungarian is he who is pained by Trianon. Ish. Magyar az, akinek fájt Right. One of the most influential far-right militant groups is called the 64 Counties Youth Movement. There have been 63 counties in Greater Hungary, including Croatia. Why do they say 64 instead? Is a mystery. The pressure is considerable. You can't read a single friendly word concerning Romania or Serbia, even in the left liberal press of Budapest. The prejudice is very deep. It has to be, as it is the main instrument of disciplining intellectual opinion. The putative left in this country is always calling for dialogue or for a reworking of memory, i.e. it is calling for a friendlier version of keeping alive the Trianon wound, aiming at a parallel mourning for the Holocaust victims and for our loss of power and supremacy over territories where there is an ethnic Hungarian minority. In both cases, it is a romanticizing and sentimentalizing of an undifferentiated loss. On the right, they say effectively that the Holocaust is maybe a painful loss for the left, while Trianon is a loss for us. The left tamely replies that it's both. That we should mourn and mourn and mourn for everybody and everything. Never is heard a critical word. The two losses are construed as opposites, and it is suggested by the great and the good that we should reconcile the two pains regardless of their completely different nature. The young middle class couldn't care less for either. History is believed to be a party affair. Speaking of class, of constitutional order, of civic liberties, of socialism, capitalism, fascism, or whatever political topic you may mention, is insensitive. And it includes the real history of the Hungarian minorities abroad, of which, as it happens, the present author used to be a member. The fact that I speak and sometimes even write in Romanian is received by silent horror. That both ancient capitals of Hungary, Presburg, Presburg, Pozsony, Bratislava, and Ofen, Buda, have been German towns, neither Slovak nor Hungarian. Compare the German Prague and the Greek Bucharest. Are silently forgotten. Such historical complexities are simply too much for contemporary ethnicism. The blunt instrument of the Versailles complex is used to smash in any critical heads and to great effect. It has nothing to do with countering ethnic discrimination. The Hungarian Conservatives in the European Parliament are proposing special regulations for autochthonous minorities, as opposed to immigrants, asylum seekers, and other assorted riffraff. And we are pained that those foreigners do not understand us. Discrimination garbed as human rights is a talk with which domestic racism is obscured and ethnocratic power is reinforced. Critics of the discourse are supposed to be the agents of the non-existence of the Entente, or of course liberal communists, Judeo-Bolshevik, ruthless cosmopolitans. Avant-garde artists, social critics, rights groups, anti-capitalist thinkers and doers are just indifferent to our pain and hence irrelevant. During the dark years of the Weimar Republic, there were more attempts at resistance than you may find in this handsome city where you are naturally most welcome. Anti-communism is understood mostly as the passing away of an anti-national system 
after the demise of which the time has finally arrived to speak out openly about the Trianon wound and the Magyar pain, that is, the moment of truth is at hand. The truth of pain is plainly announced, and this means authentic liberation. This is linked to a pathological cult of defeat. The national essence is tragic. The fading 1989 contrast between dictatorship and democracy will be superseded by another contrast that between foreigners lies forced, but that between foreigners lies forced upon us and the blinding light of our truth, which is the loss of Transylvania and of Upper Hungary, called Slovakia for some reason, by our adversaries and of the Vojvodina, we don't even want them back. We want to mourn in freedom. Are you laughing? But of course you are an enemy. <laughs> uh.